Welcome back to Trinity Bible Study. We have been in John chapter 6 for the last several days, and we have seen Jesus talking to a group of Jews who followed him across the lake, probably looking again for a free meal or something that they could not accomplish on their own. And Jesus engages them in a heavy discussion about the bread of life, and he calls himself the bread of life. And we're going to pick up there and jump right back into it. We're going to back up into a verse that we read in our last session just to give us the continuity to understand exactly where we're at. John chapter 6 verse 51. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Verse 52, the Jews therefore began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. This is just unbelievably uncomprehendable to the Jews who are standing there listening to Jesus speak. Jesus is right on the edge of what they call and what they would perceive by the certain laws in the Old Testament as being totally abhorrent. He wanted them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they're going, we don't do that. That is a sin against God. We can show you in the scriptures where that is. This is where we must look at what Jesus is saying differently than the words he is saying because of what he is trying to communicate to them. We have to ask, is he asking them to literally eat his flesh and drink his blood? Well, I think unless we believe Jesus is a down and out right lunatic, we would have to say no. And they, again, were interpreting his words through some form of the flesh, because they certainly did not see what he was saying spiritually. Now, this all ties together in a couple of ways. But the primary way that most Christians look at this passage of Scripture that Jesus is saying, because it can virtually not be interpreted fleshly, we have to understand that he is speaking by the Spirit. He is speaking an allegory, a metaphor, a type and a shadow of what is to be experienced in him, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. And we'll push it a little farther and say even in his ascension. There are four basic doctrines that almost all of Christianity adhere to regarding the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, Holy Communion. So let's look at what those four are and see how maybe what Jesus is saying will indeed apply in those situations. The first doctrine uh, of Holy Communion is probably the most widespread amongst Protestants, and it is called the symbolic doctrine. And this is where Christians come to the Lord's table to partake of bread and wine or grape juice. We'll call it wine for the sake of the conversation. They partake of the bread and the wine as a representation or a picture or a symbol of what Christ did for them in his death burial and resurrection. And of course, it is a picture in tangibles that reminds them, brings them into the remembrance of what 
Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection for them as Christians. The bread and the wine don't change. The bread and the wine are simply a tool of the illustration of what they are looking at. And they remember it most with very good reverence and appreciate the Holy Communion meal. The second doctrine is that which we would call the dynamic doctrine. And the dynamic doctrine simply says that this partaking of the bread and the wine after the elements have been consecrated brings one into spiritual nourishment. In other words, there is a power, there is a dynamos, as we would say in the Greek, in the partaking of the bread and the wine. Now this is practiced in many Protestant churches and around the world. Because when we come to the table of the Lord, there is a spiritual blessing, a spiritual nourishment, if nothing else, than in the remembrance of his death and his resurrection. And so we come to the table in that experience. The third doctrine is called consubstantiation. A lot of big words. Consubstantiation is mainly practiced in the Lutheran groups. And that is where they believe that the actual presence of Christ is on, around, and under the elements when they are partaken after they have been consecrated by the minister. This would simply mean that when you partake of the elements of bread and wine, that they are surrounded by the presence of Christ, and therefore you receive Christ in his body his, and in his flesh and in his blood that way. The fourth doctrine is practiced primarily in the Roman Catholic Church, and that is the doctrine of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is when the priest consecrates the elements by the words he says, and they become literally the body and blood of Christ, even though their appearance stays the same their substance, they are transubstized into the body and blood of Christ. And this, thus they fulfill what Jesus says here in a transformed manner of the elements of bread and wine. And most Catholics, the vast majority of them, take this very seriously. This is why the reserve elements, the body and blood of Christ, after they have, uh, after those who have partaken of it, are placed in what is called a tabernacle or a safekeeping because they actually believe that those are indeed the body and blood of Christ and may be partaken of by others who desire to. So you have four doctrines. And of course, the question that arises when we apply it to this passage of Scripture where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And when we apply that, we have to say, okay, which one of the four are right? Which one of them is the correct interpretation of this passage of Scripture? Jesus uses a phrase that is very interesting. And he says it three times here in this text. He says, when he's talking about all of this, he says, and I will raise him up on the last day. And we ask this question, what is the last day? Is it the end of the world? Is it the end of that person's life? Or is it the end of something else that we're not even comprehending? This is where we, we really have to let the Spirit of God work through the reading of his word to us. Because as we just discussed, there are a lot of tensions, doctrinal positions, pulling at this text. And again, we have to understand whether it is literal by the flesh or whether it is spiritual. And that which we must look at when we say, 
God is spirit, and those who worship him in spirit and in truth must worship him that way. And thus, when we come together to worship and we partake of the Holy Communion, we have to think of it that way too. So we have four doctrines. Each one is fairly juxtaposed to the other with the exception of what we would probably call the symbolic and the dynamic theories of Holy Communion many times are kind of attempted to be meshed together, even though those who would partake of it in a symbolic way uh, would probably say, no, we don't. But they're closer than any of the other two there. Martin Luther uh, derived the doctrine of consubstantiation because he could not agree with, in any way, the doctrine of the Roman Catholics from whom he left in transubstantiation. So we have to ask, well, did he just derive that doctrine or is there scriptural basis for it? And likewise in transubstantiation, how does that doctrine, how is that doctrine backed up scripturally? And I think there's an element of all four that we must consider and appreciate when it comes to understanding what that meal means to us. You say, well, I'm not a Catholic. I can't handle that. I'm not a Lutheran. I can't handle that. Or if you're a Catholic, you, you might even say, well, those people who look at it symbolically are almost blaspheming it. And this is where we have to understand that iron sharpens iron, as the Old Testament prophet says. And we need to understand and respect the four doctrines and maybe even a couple versions of them blended together that would help us in our journey of faith in Christ as we come to his table. For it is a very unique thing. There are other religions that practice similar type of uh, holy or sacred meals, but ours in the Christian community of faith is based solely on Jesus Christ and not on ourselves or anything we do. For at its weakest moment, it is simply a remembrance and a selection or a, a picture of what Christ has done. And that is very important. And at its strength, its full strength, it has a spiritual impact on us. For Jesus said, those who partake of this meal will indeed be raised up on the last day. In other words, there is eternal life. He has continually said that if you believe in me, if you believe what I'm saying, you will have eternal life. So the important part here is that we understand the elements of what Christ is saying without fracturing the body of Christ. And that is probably going to look a little different to almost every congregation in almost every branch sectarianism of Christianity and in almost every uh, denomination. And this is where we need to have respect and we need to honor one another in our salvation and not necessarily saying that this is the only way. This is it. The important part of what Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 4, he talks about the gift ministries of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher. He says they are to bring us into the unity of our faith. He did not say the unity of doctrine. Now, whether you put a preeminence on the scriptures as the point of reference and the only point of reference that passage of scripture should still be a foundation by which we love one another, by which we appreciate one another in the faith. And when we can do that, we can understand each other in the body of Christ a little better and help each other. Whether we agree totally or not is not the deal. The deal is we need to love one another love one another as Christ loved us. And that means all four of those doctrinal positions should respect one another, regardless of their scriptural support 
and regardless of what they believe deep within their heart. There is room for all of us. And if you are convicted especially about one of those doctrines in regard to what Jesus is saying, adhere to it. Do not condemn anyone else who doesn't. When I say condemn, I'm referring to judgment being passed on their worth or their worthlessness. Only God has that right, and only God can judge our hearts. On the other hand, if you are being convicted about the doctrinal position you have had, and you feel that God wants you to shift that, don't be afraid to do that with love and grace. Because this passage of scripture obviously meant something different to Jesus, and as we'll find out, a select few of his apostles uh, than it did to everybody listening to him. Most of the Jews who were standing there hearing him say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, were probably just astounded that such words would even come from a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish teacher, one whom they obviously had some form of respect for. They would not have followed him where they had and asked what they were asking. And so we will pick up there tomorrow and see how this wraps up and how this all comes into flourishion to understand exactly the premise by which Jesus is instructing not only the Jews here, but his apostles and his disciples. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can study it in depth and know it. Help us to meditate on it day and night. Keep our hearts and minds open for your voice and your Spirit's guidance in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus and under his authority. Amen.